All right, hi guys. So in this video, I'll be talking about what could be potentially the next financial bubble to burst or financial bubbles. Now, before I begin this video, let me just say that I hope that whatever I'm gonna say in this video is wrong. That's right, I hope I'm wrong because if I'm right, then a lot of people are gonna get hurt really bad. So I don't wanna be right on this one, but I thought that it's my responsibility to create this video to warn you because of the signs I'm seeing in the market. Um, so that if it does happen, then you know that you have been warned and you can take some precautions to prevent yourself being financially destroyed from this bubble bursting. First, understand that if you look at history, there have always been and there always will be bubbles being created in the financial markets that will burst eventually causing prices to collapse and hurting a lot of people. As long as human beings continue to have greed and continue to have fear, this will always happen. So if you look at history, the first asset bubble that was created was in 1637, there was the tulip bulb bubble. And in 1720, we had the South Sea Company bubble. In the 1980s, we had the Japanese real estate and stock bubble. In the year 2000, we had the US dot-com bubble. In 2008, we had the US real estate bubble that led to the subprime mortgage crisis that led to the Great Recession. So there have always been bubbles and crashes. So it's not a question of if this is going to happen again, it's a question of when it's going to happen again. So the next potential asset bubble to burst will be, well, that's coming up. So first and foremost, why does this shit keep happening, right? Why can't people learn from history? Well, like I said, because as long as people have greed and fear, it will always happen. So first and foremost, what creates a bubble? Well, a bubble first starts with prices of a certain asset. Could be any asset. Could be a tulip bulb, could be real estate, could be stocks, could be bonds, could be any asset, a price starts appreciating higher and higher and higher and people get excited because as price goes up people are getting rich they think i want to get rich as well so they start buying and everyone start buying now when everyone starts jumping in prices keep going up and they start going up to unsustainable levels eventually which means the price goes up and it far exceeds the fundamental value of the asset by a wide margin like look at this little graphic i drew over here right so this green line represents the fundamental intrinsic value of the asset. So what happens is that the price goes up to a level where it's far beyond what that asset should really be worth and it becomes unsustainable, right? You know, can't go up and stay up there forever. So why does this happen? Because it is speculative demand. People buying, hoping to sell at a higher price, it's speculative demand rather than the intrinsic worth that fuels the inflated prices. So people, when they buy, they know it's a crazy price. But they say it's okay because someone else would buy it at an even crazier price. So we call this the greater fool's theory. They know that if I buy my fool to pay this price, but as long as I sell to a bigger fool that's willing to pay a higher price, I can make money. So when everyone thinks that way, the price keeps going up. But eventually, like a Ponzi scheme, uh, it will eventually end, right? The bubble eventually will pop and the price will have a massive sell-off and causing dramatic price declines. Now, here's the thing. These speculative bubbles are very hard to recognize while they are happening because when you're in it, it's like you can't see it. But after it crashes and you look back, it becomes very obvious after it has burst. The first step to recognizing when something's in a bubble is to know, first of all, what is the fundamental value, the actual intrinsic value of the asset. So you can see that when the price gets too far from that, eventually it's got to get back to that value. It's got to come back home eventually. So how do you determine the fundamental or intrinsic value of any asset? That's the most important question to ask. So here's the answer. The intrinsic value of any asset comes from what it can produce or from its utility. So what does that mean? You see, there are two kinds of assets in the world. The first are what we call productive assets. And these are the assets that I like to invest in because productive assets, they produce cash flow. They, they produce things. So for example, you have got real estate. 
So when you own real estate, it produces cash flow in terms of rental income that you can collect. If you own stocks, now what are stocks? Stocks are businesses. You own part of a business. Business generates profits and cash flow. And again, that generates dividends or retained earnings. If you own bonds, that generates interest from your bonds. If you own farmland, that you know it produces crops, that you can sell the crops to generate cash. So when you own a productive asset, an asset that makes something, it's pretty easy to determine the value of the asset because the value of the asset comes from what it can produce. So for example, look at real estate. So how do you know what real estate should be worth? So for example, if your property has a rental yield of say 5% yield. So what does that mean? So that basically means that if you buy a property for half a million dollars, every year you get about 5% in terms of rental income, which is $25,000, right? So if every year you can collect 25,000, 25,000, 25,000, in about, in about 20 years, you get back the cash you paid for the property. Does it make sense? So think about it. If you buy a property today, after 20 years, you get back half a million dollars of cash, plus you still own the property. That's a productive asset. In general, when a property has a rental yield of 5%, it's considered fairly priced. But if the rental yield falls way below 5%, like 2% or 1%, that tells you that the property is overpriced. It's in a bubble. Why? Because at that price, it's going to take too many years to generate the rental income to pay for that property. So how about stocks? Do stocks have intrinsic value? Yes, because when you buy a stock, you're buying a business. Now, what is a business worth? Well, the intrinsic value of a business is the present value of its future cash flow. In other words, you've got to figure out how much cash the company generates for the next 20, 30 years. You discount that to present value. That gives you the intrinsic value. And of course, I use an intrinsic value calculator to calculate that valuation. So for example, right now, Apple's intrinsic value is about $100. And Apple is selling at $134, which means that right now Apple is overvalued. Apple's overpriced by 34%. Whereas Amazon's intrinsic value is about $4,000. So right now, Apple, uh, sorry, right now, Amazon's share price is $3,300, which means Amazon is undervalued, whereas Apple is overvalued. So it's very easy to tell whether stocks are expensive or cheap because there's a fundamental intrinsic value based on the company's earnings and cash flow. Next, you have got non-productive assets. So these are things that you buy that don't generate any cash, they don't produce anything. So for example, you have got gold, non-productive asset. Of course, recently you've got digital currencies like Bitcoin, which is basically you're buying a computer code, a part of a computer code. Now think about it again, if you buy a piece of property or business, in 10 years, you would have generated all that cash and dividends and profits and you would still own that property or that business. But if you own a piece of gold today, you, own a, you buy a bar of gold, in 20 years, it's still that one bar of gold. The gold wouldn't multiply, you won't produce cash, it's still that bar of gold. The same thing if you buy, again, a cryptocurrency, right? You're buying a programming code. So in 10 or 20 years, what would you have? You'd still have that same code if it still exists, by the way. So for non-productive assets, is there an intrinsic value? Well, it's debatable. It's really hard to value it because it doesn't make anything. So the only value comes from its utility. Its utility and a lot of the value comes from what we call psychological value. It is worth what people think it is worth. It's purely psychological. And if people change their mind about what it's worth, it could drop in value by half or 80% or go up by 80% the next day. So does gold have a utility? Is it used for something? Yes, gold has a utility because gold uh, is used in the manufacturing process of certain things as well as it can be used for jewelry, right? Uh, how about Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies? Does it have a utility? Again, it's, it's debatable. Some people say, well, 
it's a currency, but is it a currency? I'm not too sure. For me, not yet at least, because it's not really a storehold of wealth for most people because it's too volatile to be a storehold of wealth, right? Drops, you can go up and down 25% over the weekend, right? The next thing is, is it a medium of exchange? Well, not really, it's not widely adopted and it's very inefficient at transferring money. So in other words, what is the true value of these non-productive assets right now? The answer is, is purely psychological. It's purely what people think it is worth. Are any of these assets in a financial bubble? Well, let's take a cue from history. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And like Mark Twain said, history doesn't always repeat, but it often rhymes. So let's take a look back at history to understand how financial bubbles were created and how they ended. And let's begin with the first known financial bubble that happened back in 1634 to 1637. This was known as tulip mania that happened in the Netherlands. Back in the day, tulip bulbs were already a status symbol of the rich. They were pretty expensive, but what happened was in 1634, these tulip bulbs, especially the rare bulbs, started increasing in price rapidly, right? Going up every single day. And people who bought those bulbs became really rich overnight. So it's always the same movie, but different actors. So sure enough, everyone sees, hey, that guy's getting rich. We want to get rich and tulip bulbs are the way to get rich. So everyone starts buying tulip bulbs until the price went up to crazy levels. Prices surged to the equivalent of $76,000 for today's money for one single bulb. In fact, people were so crazy, they even exchanged five hectares of land for one single bulb. And again, that's the greater fool's theory. So when people bought it, they knew it's crazy, but I can sell it to someone even crazier. And that creates that massive bubble. Now in 1636, it went mainstream where now people could trade tulip bulbs on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, as well as nearby European exchanges. And they even created futures exchanges and options contracts on tulip bulbs, where now people could trade tulip bulbs with high leverage, with bored money. So this fueled the speculation, the price went up all the way to the very top. And sure enough, eventually people realized, what am I doing? It's a freaking flower, I'm giving up my life savings. So one day people woke up, it's kind of like, you know, in a bubble, people are like drunk, no, they're like drunk or hypnotized. And one day they realize, what am I doing? They get sober. And that's when the sentiment changes, psychology changes, and the bubble pops. And now nobody wants a darn flower, right? And the thing crashes. Prices fell 90% in six weeks. And of course, people who went in and bought a top lost everything they had. And it triggered an economic recession and depression that affected the Dutch economy for years and years to come. So that was the first recorded asset financial bubble crash. And of course, a more recent one would be the dot-com bubble. Again, same movie, different actors, but it's always the same story, right? So now this is something that I can relate to because the dot-com bubble happened when I was in a university. Now, at that time, you know, I just started learning to use computers in the university and I was just exploring this thing called the internet. The internet was just getting used by people like, like you know, general public, right? So there started to be massive growth in the use and adoption of the internet. And because of that, internet companies were thought to be the wave of the future. And internet companies were the new economy. So any company with a dot com, prices went crazy, right? So what happened, I remember at the time was, any company that went IPO, uh, dot com company, they would like initial public offering, they would IPO at say $20, and by the end of the day, it would be like 500 bucks. And it happened to all the companies that had dot com. And these companies were not making any money, right? And because of the excitement of it being revolutionary, it's gonna change the world, everyone bought into it. And again, people who bought any dot com com dot com company they got rich overnight so sure enough it's the same story right so as people get rich more people are drawn in everybody wants a piece of the action my mom says i want to buy tech stocks dot com everyone rounds me buying dot com stocks and everyone believed that it was the way to get rich and everywhere you went if you went to parties in the workplace everyone talked about one thing 
dot-com stocks. Everyone was buying it, including the guy sweeping the road on the streets. And I still remember at that time, it came to a level where it, it really didn't make sense, right? For example, Yahoo, which was one of the early dot-com companies, the price-to-earnings ratio was 1,062. Another company, which was known as AOL, America Online, one of the biggest dot-com companies at the time, had a PE ratio of 217. Now, at least they were making money, right? But there were many dot-com companies that were not making money, but were selling at crazy prices, like Pets.com. Right? Pets.com, you know, losing money, but was selling at a price to sales ratio of 640 freaking six. What does that mean? Now, usually when a stock has a price to sales ratio of above five, it's crazy expensive normally, right? And this is 646. Another company was ICGE, which was Internet Capital Group, uh, losing money, price to sales ratio 800. And you had many other companies you had Netscape, Boo, GeoCities, these were all the dot-com companies. And the funny thing is this, right? You would say, how can these companies be selling at such crazy valuations, especially those not making money? So that's when many analysts and bankers said, well, you know, times have changed. Now it's a revolution. So traditional valuation methods like profits, like earnings, like cash flow, you know, that's old stuff. It doesn't apply anymore, right? So now people were valuing companies using new methods known as clicks. How many clicks did the website get? They used another metric known as eyeballs, right? So as long as there were people looking at a website, people clicking on it, it justified the crazy prices. So as you know, the NASDAQ, is made up of mostly these technology companies. So the NASDAQ went crazy. The NASDAQ went up 400% from 1995 to the year 2000, right? It went from 800 points to 5,000 points. Well, everyone around me was buying dot-com stocks in the hope of getting rich. I was lucky because I was in a university, in the University of Singapore, and I majored in finance. So I studied how to value companies and I looked at the stock price and I said, it doesn't make any freaking sense. For example, Yahoo, which was one of the biggest dot-com companies at the time, the biggest search engine, Yahoo was selling at about $220 per share. And I calculated the intrinsic value based on my finance uh, knowledge. And I said, you know what? The stock's worth five bucks. It's worth five bucks, it's selling at 220 bucks. Are they insane? So I refuse to buy any of those stocks. I just sit on the sidelines and say, you know what? It's not gonna last, right? So people laughed at me and they said, Adam, why aren't you participating? You know, and I found solace reading about this guy called Warren Buffett. In fact, that's how I got to know about Warren Buffett because I started reading his articles and I found that he was one of the few people who also refused to participate in this bubble. In fact, uh, Warren Buffett warned about the bubble and he was criticized by people who said he just didn't get it. He didn't understand technology. He was a dinosaur. He was missing out. In 1998, he started selling stocks. He said, it's too expensive. Forget it. I'm not buying any more stocks. And guess what? For the next two years, the market went up another 40%. So he missed out as everyone was making money except him. In fact, in 1999, the S&P 500 gained 18%. And people who had, who had no knowledge of finance, amateurs were making a few hundred percent when this guy Warren Buffett was down 23%. In fact, they ran an article on Barron's, a magazine, and they asked this question, what's wrong with you, Warren? All right? So one of the things I've learned from that is you cannot be swayed by the crowd. You gotta to stick to your principles and do what you believe is right. And the challenge is when everyone is making money except you, you tend to get influence, right? So the challenge to be a successful investor is to stay rational when everyone is irrational. And especially when everyone around you seems to be making money and you get left behind, you got to not join in, join in the FOMO, the fear of missing out. So 
I didn't join in, Buffett didn't join in, but criticized, we got laughed at, but of course eventually we were vindicated because what goes up will always come down, it's unsustainable. So what happened was in the year 2000 March, once the Nasdaq hit 5,000 points, the game was over, right? The bubble burst and the Nasdaq crashed, losing over 80% of its value by the end of 2002 for two-year bear market. And most of the dot-com stocks went bankrupt. In fact, out of the 280 stocks in the index, 150 stocks fell by 80 to 95%. Yahoo, which was the biggest search engine at the time, fell from $220, it fell all the way to less than $5, which was actually the true intrinsic value of that company. So remember, eventually, prices will always come down to what it's really worth fundamentally. So after the dot-com crash, seven years later, it will be the housing bubble crash. Again, same movie, we can't help ourselves, greed and fear, different actors. So again, this was a US housing bubble. So this uh, bubble actually started back in 2003. So from 2003 to 2006, home prices in the US kept rising steadily. And when prices keep going up, people get this mindset that it'll never come down, it can only go up. So more and more people who in real estate started making a lot of money, started to get rich, and sure enough, people had the mindset that the way to get rich is now in real estate. It was dot com, now it's real estate. So there's always something new that makes people think they can get rich easily and quickly. To fuel the speculation, we had all these real estate gurus coming up with seminars and programs and books saying that, you know, everyone can get rich in real estate. And many of these gurus were teaching people to buy real estate uh, using a lot of debt, right? Their motto was, no cash required, no money down. This guy called Robert Allen wrote a book called No Money Down, Buying Property with No Money Down, Borrow a lot of money, you don't need any credit, no experience required. And the idea was that if you buy any house and the price went up, you would refinance, take out cash and buy two properties. Price goes up, refinance, take out cash, buy three properties and you buy more and more properties as the price goes up and you keep flipping for higher and higher profits. Now, of course, as, as long as property prices go up, this game continues, right? But eventually it's gonna crash uh, once prices get too high. So what was really dangerous was US home prices, they were increasingly being driven up, not by people buying to stay in the house like now, but at the time people were buying simply to flip for, for profit, right? They were driven by speculators and speculators with increasingly bad credit. And they took on what was known as subprime mortgages. A subprime mortgage is basically when someone takes a mortgage when they have questionable credit. They may have, uh, they may have no income or no job, but the bank still lends them the money because they think, you know what, property price is gonna go up anyway, so no worries, we'll lend you the money, right? So many speculators were over leveraging, in fact, if you watch this movie called The Big Short, they show this stripper who owned five houses and a condo with just a very small income. And banks were also giving up ninja loans. Ninja stands for no income, no job, we'll give you a loan. And what happened was at a time, see usually subprime mortgages, which are bad credit mortgages, make up about 5% or 10% of the entire mortgage market. But with all these people buying properties with bad credit, subprime mortgages started making up 23% of the mortgage market. And what banks did was they knew that all these mortgages were risky. So they packaged them into mortgage-backed securities, MBS and CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and sold it to investors worldwide. So everyone in the world, they were holding assets that were backed by these risky mortgages. By 2004, home prices started to go parabolic. What does parabolic mean? It means that prices start to go up almost 90 degrees. And that is usually an indication that the bubble is nearing the top. You see, usually when prices go up in an uptrend, prices go up in a 45 degree fashion. 45 degrees? And what happens, it will then go up 90 degrees, 
towards the end of the bubble and it goes up really steeply and that's when it's gonna burst. So you can see this 90 degree surge right towards 2005. So as prices were going up, you know, 90 degrees parabolic, again, sign of the top, you can see that the amount of mortgages that was subprime or bad credit also reached a peak of 23.5%. So more and more mortgages were low quality mortgages and prices were the top. So that was signs of a bubble. And this guy called Michael Burry, he saw this happening and, you know, he shorted the market back in 20. Or five, in fact, 2005. If you watch the movie The Big Shot, he shorted a couple of billion dollars worth of mortgage backed securities using credit default swaps. So, what happened? Well, eventually in 2006, home prices peaked and the bubble burst and home prices started declining 30%. When home prices dropped, what happened to all these people who bought houses? They could no longer refinance and they couldn't pay their mortgages, and so their mortgages went into default. So you can see the defaults from 5 to 10% started skyrocketing to uh, up to 40% default rate for these subprime mortgages. So when they got into default, these people uh, went bankrupt, right? They were declared bankrupt, and all those mortgage-backed securities that were sold to people all around the world they lost almost all their value. And many of the banks that still held these mortgages, uh, they almost went bankrupt. So AIG almost went bankrupt, if you remember. Citigroup almost went bankrupt. Lehman Brothers, one of the oldest investment banks in the world, over a hundred year old bank, went bankrupt. And that triggered the global financial crisis and Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. And that's what eventually brought down the stock market. So the S&P 500 crashed 55% over one and a half years. And again, the Great Recession started. The challenges of a bubble is that you never know when it's going to burst. You know it's going to burst, but you never know exactly when. And no matter how high prices are, they could get a lot higher. Like I can tell you right now, Bitcoin cryptocurrency is in a freaking bubble. But you know what? It could still go up another 100%. So for example, if you look at Michael Burry, Michael Burry shorted the market in 2005. But after he shorted the market, it kept going up for two more years. As a result, his fund had an unrealized loss of about $70 million. He had to hold on to that loss saying, I'm going to be right soon, I'm not sure when. Eventually, when the bubble burst in October 2007 and the market crashed, his fund made over $800 million. So that's the challenge. And people ask me, and why don't you short the market or short cryptocurrency or short certain assets if you think it's overvalued because expensive could become even more expensive. The same thing happened in a, in a dot-com bubble. Again, in 1998, prices were already insane and Buffett started getting out. He stopped buying. But from 1998 to 2000, the market went up another 40% before the bubble finally burst. And that's the main challenge, picking the exact top. What can we learn by studying past bubbles and crashes? Well, we can learn that there are certain patterns that keep recurring again and again. So once we can recognize these patterns, we know that we're in a bubble, we can be careful and we can manage our risk. So there are altogether seven warning signs that an asset is in a bubble. So let's go through these seven warning signs in the next part of this video. I'll see you soon. If you want to catch my latest videos, click on the subscribe button right now. Click on the bell so you get instant notifications once I upload my latest video. If you want to check out my online courses, go to piranaprofits.com. We're going to learn how to invest and how to trade the financial markets and create an income from all around the world. If you want to join my live Wealth Academy program, go on to wealthacademyglobal.com and find out more about how you can learn investing and trading live online. This is Adam Koo and may the markets be with you.